Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill. I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Christopher Mills of Harwood Capital, one of the UK's finest small and mid-cap investors. So uh, welcome, Christopher. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, well, I'm a bit battered, I must admit. I mean, it's been pretty tough sledging over the past sort of like six to 12 months, just about for everybody across all different types of asset class. Um, yeah, tell but, me uh, about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And that's largely not least because of the Ukraine-Russia war, sort of like rising interest rates and inflation expectations alongside now, obviously, the cost of living crisis. But equally, as we mentioned, sort of like in the equity world, valuations have now reset lower significantly on a lot of sort of quality stock sort of babies in the bath water so putting all that together with your sort of like unique insights both on the sort of the public and the private markets what's your sort of outlook for for equities going forward well i suppose we in north atlantic were, were quite lucky because you know we went into this mess with about 160 million in cash mm. or about you know over 20 about 23 percent of our assets and a great majority of that was in us dollars so that's given us a bit of insulation. But, you know, it's very hard, I think, to be too optimistic about equities at the moment uh, for the very obvious reasons that inflation is unquestionably going to eat into consumer disposable income. Um, you know, you've got people in the United States basically saying the Federal Reserve is going to engineer a recession. You're coming off a um, very high level of corporate profits as a proportion of GNP. Um, so there's quite a lot of things that can start to go wrong. Um, on top of which, uh, as we've agreed, you know, interest rates are probably going to be rising for the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. Um, so, you know, rising interest rates, falling disposable income. Um, and in the United Kingdom, higher taxes as well as people move into uh, higher tax bans, which as a result of inflation, you know, certainly doesn't make you think this is going to be a very happy time. Um, so, you know, we're still pretty cautious, although, in fact, we are actually trying to we are, in fact, starting to spend some of our money at the moment, mm. but very much focused on things that we believe will be relatively unimpacted. Uh, by a downturn in, in consumer expenditure. Yeah, I mean, obviously you've had a pretty illustrious career, sort of like um, with, you know, starting probably sometime in the 70s, but you've seen so many of these cycles, certainly the the downturn and the sort of like the unemployment problems of the early 80s. We had obviously the 87 crash. We then had the 90s recession. We had the dot-com blow up, had the great financial crisis, we obviously had COVID. So you've seen this movie before in numerous different guises. And given your well, sort of really like... i go back longer than that. I started working in 1975 in the city and you can remember what 74 was like. <laughs> okay, well, even better. So you've got fantastic <laughs> exposure to inflation and how best to navigate it. Now, if you've put, if you've obviously cleverly you know sort of like got your, ha your cash in in dollars then as you say it's provided a good insul insulation sort of like um you know changing your sort of like you've been cautious up to this point and you still are cautious obviously but you you, you mentioned you sort of going a bit more on the front foot sort of like, are you seeing i mean we'll talk about those in the details but just sort of broad picture have we reached sort of like peak silly valuations in baby and the bathwater stocks here well i think and I'll give you an example of something we've just bought a reasonable stake in, which is mm. a company called Randall and Quilter. Mm. Uh, Randall and Quilter had a bid at 175p a share. Arbitrage has piled in. 25% uh, or just over 25% of the shareholders rejected the bid. Uh, the arbitrage has bailed out. Um, everybody knew the bid, uh, knew that the company needed 100 million because 100 million dollars of goodwill had come off their balance sheet and that had to be replaced with the regulatory capital. And the person who bid 175p knew that. Um, so we taken a reasonable stake, um, an average purchase price of about 90, 99, right. actually 98. Again, um, against an acquisition price, a bid price of 175. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, you know, it's in the public domain um, that at our entry price, that value of the business at about four hundred and sixty million dollars. 
Uh, it's in the public domain. The company says it expects to make at least $90 million in 2024. Uh, the business should be pretty recession proof because uh, one of its businesses is basically an insurance platform, which enables insurance companies to write business in jurisdictions where they don't have a license. Um, and they take a 5% fee for that. Uh, the platform was grown very rapidly. Uh, last year, it was up nearly 100% um, to about a billion of, of annual turnover. And they've already forecast 1.75 billion for this year. Um, the second business is a, it was a capital intensive business, uh, but they've changed that. Uh, what they do is they uh, take on uh, basically old insurance companies, captive insurance companies, mm -hmm. and they take over the running off of those captive insurance companies. Now, again, uh, within the last year, they raised $280 million from third parties um, and they put in $70 million of their own. Um, and basically they've turned it into a fund management business where they take a fee of 4% or just over 4% of the gross reserves they're managing. Now, to put that in context, uh, the, the 350 million that they've got in that in that vehicle should be able to support something in the region of two billion of gross reserves. So, you've got a budding little fund management company there, which nobody's focusing on. You've got a platform which is completely the wrong price, um, and then also you've got the final runoff of all the captives that they've got in their books, which is the capital intensive bit, but which will ultimately start throwing out capital. Mm. So those are the sort of things that, frankly, if you get rising interest rates, that's probably going to be good news for them mm. because they're going to have all those reserves uh, earning more money. Um, and they're turning from being a capital intensive business into a capital light business. And we got in a discount to their tangible book. Um, Crikey. <laughs> so, you know, that, they're starting to sort of come out there. And uh, yeah. so you wait, you wait, what you wait, you're basically waiting for sort of like crazy opportunities like that are just not a must buys. One thing, one thing that seems really strange as well is that when you look at the sort of the discount for, you know, obviously your two, your sort of two flagship unit trusts, you've got. Onyx International, which is a, 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 a 16, 17% discount to net assets. And then you've got North Atlantic smaller companies. No, it's a bit smaller than that now, or it's about 10. Oh, is it? I was about 10%, is it? But I mean, yes. North Atlantic was on 25 or something like that. I've got well, it's on more. I think the problem with North Atlantic is that people at the moment are very worried about people with unquoted investments. Mm. And uh, Frankly, they shouldn't be in this case. Um, mm. If we go through our portfolio, I'll do it very quickly. We could easily do the whole hour on that alone. Um, <laughs> in the third fund, there's a company called Utitech. Yeah. It's currently in our books for $30 million. There are two bids on the table at $40 million. Now, we own, we own a third of that fund. Mm. Um, Utitech is a specialty manufacturer of components for medical equipment. It'll do about four and a half million of EBITDA this year. So the bids are about nine times EBITDA. Mm. Um, and that would be a lot of money coming back to us. That'd be about $15 million. Uh, then in the fourth fund, which is going well too, we're about to sell a company called Covent Bridge. Uh, Covent Bridge basically is a global leader in assisting insurance companies to mitigate fraud. Uh, that sounds very fancy, but what that actually means is following people around and taking pictures of them who claim that they're, they've got a personal injury problem when they're, in fact, more than capable of playing squash. Uh, <laughs> we also, the company also does exam fraud. Uh, it does... Uh, that, they'll be busy. <laughs> for the federal government in the United States, it does uh, food stamp fraud, and it does Medicare, Medicaid equipment fraud. Um that's in process to be sold. Um, and that could also generate quite a lot of money for us. Mm. Um, other companies in there is a, uh, a, a components business, which sources hard to find components, which as you can imagine is booming at the moment to say the least. Yeah. Um, 
ironically, it's a business you'd expect to be a disaster, but it isn't. Uh, it's an airline catering business. Um, even in COVID, um, it actually made its budget because one of its biggest customers is Federal Express. And Federal Express okay. went through the roof. And then our fifth fund, which is getting to be fully invested, uh, we've already had one exit, which we held for less than a year, which was a data center business, um, which went out about 2.7 times. Um, we've got another company, which is in our books for 30 million at the moment. It's a property management business. Uh, we have a bid on the table, which we hope to close by the end of July for 50 million. And we own about a quarter of that. Mm. Um, a quarter of that fund. We then have another, me- we have a medical packaging business and a specialty cosmetics packaging business. Um, again, those businesses are still doing really well. Um, they're valued. If we were to get eight times EBITDA, that would be another about to 5 million uplift for North Atlantic. And we're considering putting those up for sale soon. Uh, recent investments would be Mr. Fothergill's Seeds, which you might have heard of because actually it's a well known brand. Uh, we're negotiating to buy another specialty components business. Um, we also so, you, uh, so you've got so big picture wise. I mean, essentially, what you're saying is that the you know the valuations you've got in your book for net assets for all the private quoted businesses are, are, are well asset backed. If if not anything, they're reasonably prudent given you've got some sales coming through anyway. So it does make well, it. Well, they're all they're all boring businesses. There's no technology in there at all. But boring's, but boring's the new word nowadays. As long as, it, <laughs> as long as it stays stable or goes up, then hey, that well, I'll take that any day of the week. Yeah, I mean, we've got a, we got a pet food business in there that's doing well too. So yeah, I mean, it's so so you know because I've been doing a few presentations recently that everybody's focusing on unquoted, um, but we're feeling really comfortable about our portfolio. Yeah, I mean, again, I point investors. I mean, you know, my my view is that we've reached, we haven't reached it, but we're getting there. It's peak silly valuation season, and when you see North Atlantic and companies like that, you know, investment trusts that have, <laughs> have delivered double digit returns over 40, 50 years since inception, which says says a lot to say the least through peaks and whatever it is and recessions, and <clears throat> and to try and to trade at such a, a deep valuation with <clears throat> with asset backing with lots of cash. People should just like thinking, okay, if I don't want to do all the hard work of, of, of stock picking, <laughs> then an investment trust into Harwood or into uh, North Atlantic is uh, is not a stupid play. Now, now, just uh, moving on to some individual sort of like public companies that obviously investors can yeah. can put some money into themselves. One you've been picking up and adding to. You already had a large position because obviously the. Um, the, the the strategic what was it called uh, Rockwell strategic has now moved over um, into the portfolio, but but Northbridge or now Crestchick, a load bank business. I know you you one of your businesses, you one of your funds have been nibbling on that one, and I think I think you're actually on about uh, in some some in the twenty percent now. Yeah, um, I think we're probably close to twenty four, twenty five to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean. I mean, obviously, I know. Do you want to take us through that one? Because it look again, it looks mispriced, even though the shares have done pretty well. Okay, well, the way we kind of see that is at the current price, the market cap's about 56, 57 million, right? Yep. Um, I think the latest broker's forecast is EBITDA of 8.2 million. That's correct. And you can always, you can always assume that... Uh, uh, there's about at least 800,000 of public company expense. So you're looking at a business mm. making nine minutes of EBITDA. Um, we were originally cautious about it because they've historically done very badly in oil services, but they're basically out of that business now, thank God. Um, <laughs> so you've now got a, a, a pure play on um, Crestchick. And Crestchick is a kind of a pure play on ever increasing demand for electricity. Um, yeah. From you know, electronic charging points are going to need ultimately that the ultimate source is going to need a load bank somewhere from uh, data centers, mm. um, you know, very broad industrial uses. So we think uh, that they've just increased their capacity in uh, the UK by 60% because they couldn't produce enough they've just opened a new facility in america um so i think if you look at it 
nine, nine, nine sevens to 63. So you're looking at something at six and a half times EBITDA. Um, one of the things with a company is that uh, they, depre- they depreciate the equipment yes. over 10 years, but it yes. lasts 20. So the earnings are understated, uh, mm. particularly so when the company is adding new equipment to its fleet. Um, and the other thing that perhaps you don't know is we had our property team go and look at their, uh, their uh, facilities. Uh, they have a very big site in the middle of England, and it's actually very valuable. Uh, we think that site's worth about eight million pounds, which is quite a lot more than it's on the books for. So what's not to like, really? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think um, given they've just increased the capacity by 60%, they've had record order books for four years, it's going to head to uh, an EBITDA of, they'll have further upgrades over the next two years. And I could see 2023 being an EBITDA of, of 10 mil, and I would put a 10 times EBITDA. And I know you might say that's a bit rich, but given the depreciation policy is so conservative, and it's just, you, you, you're not looking on, a, on an apples and an apples basis with the other rental companies and uh, you could do a 10 times multiple on a you know it's on a on 10 times ebitda 100 mil yeah. 30 million I mean, shares you get we, over don't, three we don't like well i think the first point to remember is just it's not all rental there is in fact a, no you're right a, a manufacturing business in there so yeah but actually you know typically we don't like rental companies because they don't generate much cash but this one does <laughs> Well, that's an interesting one for, for for people to have a look at. Another one you've sort of had a good nibble at uh, last week. And again, it's just ridiculous. It's back to sort of like um, IPO levels is Verici, which is an immunodiagnostics um, uh, business for kidney transplants. So, admittedly, it's sort of like um, just starting to commercialize its lead sort of like post-operation um, diagnostic uh, uh, Tutiva. And that'll take it next year or so. But even so, it came through with... Uh, very good sort of testing results that the market just seemed to totally misunderstand. What, what well, do you think? Go on. Well, what I think the market missed was they said, oh, God, it's only whatever it is, just under 70%. Mm. They aren't allowed to say in a public release that CareDX, which is our competitor, mm. we're three times better than. So people thought this was a bad announcement when, in fact, it was just a stunningly good announcement. Yeah. So you're saying the biggest uh, competitor is three times is three times less. We are three times better than the the, the, than the competitor. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, that does change it. And the key, as I understand it, the key metric is the is the positive uh, predictive value, not the negative predictive, not the negative predictive value. Simply because yeah, the, no, the positive predictive value is three times better than the competition. Mm. It's wow. just crazy silly. And yeah. people thought that people thought it was bad news. It, it was stunningly good news. And, and, and my understanding is they have three hospital systems um, lined up to uh, take the product as soon as it becomes commercial, which will be this year. Great. OK, well, and yeah, the of something like this is there aren't that many hospital systems that do that do kidney transplants. So, so reaching them is not as expensive as launching a normal diagnostic. Right. Okay. Gotcha. So actually the, uh, the commercialization strategy could, as long as you've got good contacts into these, um, into these few centers, then could be faster and cheaper than um, it normally is for, for larger. Well, one like- of the hospitals that we believe is doing it, um, the man is, the, you know, the leading clinician there is extremely well known in the United States, very highly respected. I mean, as highly respected as Barbara was, well, probably not quite as highly, but um, but certainly way up there. Mm. So that's why we bought some more. Good. Well, we'll come on to some more um, uh, life science stocks because there's lots of fallen angels. But before we do that, I noticed again a a recent purchase, just an an adding on, was uh, was Hostmall that I think is it span out of a private equity um, investment trust and it does the uh, Fridays restaurant dining chain and. 63rd and 1st Street, which is a new one. But um, I, the, obviously, it's t- it's it's tough in the, the consumer area. But again, this, the shares have just been absolutely annihilated. I mean, they're back down to 32p as today, which puts them on a, a price earnings ratio, if I look at it, even on reduced expectations, of 2.6. <laughs> yeah, that's EV bit DA, and it's, it, it is absurd. Um, yeah. I think... I think the whole thing 
I mean, we were, we didn't invest in the IPO. The IPO did 150p a share, mm. uh, which valued the company at the time at about 210 million. Mm. Uh, we know there was private equity interest at a few tens of millions less than that. Mm. Um, but I suppose people got greedy or whatever um, and hope for the future, you know, hope for the best. Yeah. We've spoken to the former chief executive officer of the business, had a long chat with her, who basically convinced me this is a thoroughly good business. We've spoken to the management of the company who um, we actually knew from another event where we, where we might have actually offered them a job on something. Okay, this is Ro- Ro- Robert Cook, is it? And uh, he's a CEO, isn't he? I think. And Alan yeah, Clark. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it's just completely the wrong price. The fundamental yeah. problem with it is, is it's also owned by completely the wrong people because, basically, it was the sort of fan club that broke up Electra, mm. and they were either investment funds or they were. You know, funds invested in you know large, large-ish cap, and suddenly they were all dumped with two small stocks, mm. um, and there isn't a natural ownership base. And that's the fundamental problem. The whole thing. Right. Okay. Um, well, so it'll take time to work that one through, I guess. Meaning, meaning opportunities for sort of like uh, canny investors to be able to buy at distress levels at ridiculous well, levels of. It is a fundamentally good business. Um, it's yes, it's going to be hit by food inflation, but this is a business that's wet led more than food led. Mm. And obviously, drink inflation is nothing like what food inflation is. Mm. Um, the demographic is relatively young, so hopefully, they've still got some money. Um, I almost take that as a as a compliment because I went there when I was uh, I think it was about fourteen fifteen to one of their first restaurants on the Hagley Road in Birmingham and I had a great time watching people throw cocktails around. But that's what it is. So yeah, um, we just think it's the wrong price. The trouble is we got that wrong. We we started too early, but it is what it is. Um, so so just moving now. Know, I mean, one Sorry. day we will be out of a recession. Restaurant mm-hmm. groups will be back in favour again, and uh, hopefully. Um, you know, they're talking about getting their EBITDA margins into the mid-teens, which means you could easily get to, you know, 30, 35 million. Yeah. I know they look, they're looking in the medium term, I think, to double their, their uh, restaurant footprint. And it has a lot of, it has a lot of sort of like kudos with oldies like me who have been before and have nice memories. So uh, it's certainly a place that, uh, that, that I would, if I could eat there, would be good. So uh, <laughs> would be nice. Um, just now moving to some fallen angels, which you obviously know quite a lot. So, you know, I don't want to put you in a, in a sort of like a, a position with sensitivity, et cetera, but a sort of EKF healthcare, you know, sorry, EKF diagnostics, you've got uh, uh, renalytics, source bio and, and Circassia, all of them have sort of like fallen really hard of late and they're all quality business with high recurring revenue streams and good growth prospects. Do you want to start off with, with EKF for starters? Because that's come a long way. I know. Well, I, look, I mean, we, were, we, we started buying again at 35 Mm. Um, the current market price, the the enterprise value is about 145 million. Yeah. Um, the cash they just announced is 21 million. That's correct. Um, because they were successful in getting a major customer to uh, take back some inventory that that customer had ordered. Um, market forecast for this year is 16 million. Effectively, we'll assume COVID is over and finished. Um, and the company spent nearly 10 million now developing its enzymes business. So if you just forget COVID, we never really got the benefit of being a COVID company. And we're certainly now getting the downside of being one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is business, uh, if, you, if you look at it, has really good world leading positions in diabetes, um, testing for hemoglobin, uh, testing for ketone acetosis, a very good enzymes business, pr- you know, providing product to major drug companies such as Roche. Um, and that's where a lot of the money that we made out of COVID 
uh, we've gone and spent that money now on building our enzymes business, where there's a real niche in the market between the major players who you know service the food companies and the universities who do very small batches. So small batches of three, four, five million dollars um, sounds a lot, but truthfully, you know those are small batches. Um, it's a bit of a niche. It's a niche we think we can exploit very successfully um, and make a great deal of money on it. So, you know, I'd be disappointed if the company wasn't earning nothing to do with COVID, well over 20 million within a couple of years. Um, and then, you know, people just simply start hopefully realizing that these things are worth somewhere between 12 and a half and 15 times EBITDA when they're taken over. Yeah. Um, and on, and, that 20, and on that 20 million, effectively, if you're talking about a 125 sort of market cap, that's six, well, less. it's just over six times EBITDA compared to a potential buyout of, of 12, isn't it? Double. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm. Um, but it is what it is. And the trouble is buying stock, it doesn't help us very much because we have to sell <laughs> um, because we've yeah. got 29.9%. So, yeah. Um, Anyway, um, if we do Centaur again, uh, no. Well, no what, what about before? Before what about uh, Renalytics? Because that's come off hard as well on the on the sort of fallen angel. Renalytics is, is basically what has happened in the United States is that <clears throat> all these small biotechnology companies have just totally collapsed. Mm. Um, Renalytics now has sufficient cash to uh, to support its rollout over the next two years. And the key to Renalytics is uh, seeing if we can do some more deals with major pharma companies and more importantly, rolling out the uh, VETS program, which is, a, which is a large program. And then obviously it's taken longer to get uh, FDA approval than we thought. This Although, is the military, the military veterans in the States, yeah. Correct, yes. How much, how much better is their lead sort of like um, kidney, uh, yeah, their lead product better than the sort of competition, given it's in the similar sort of space, isn't it? A bit further up there the food chain. To... There isn't oh, any see, okay. <laughs> there's, no, there's no standard of care. So it's really, it gets FDA sort of like uh, orphan drug status and, uh, uh, and it's the only game in town. Yes, that's correct. Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, it does look, uh, it's come off really hard and looks ridiculous. Another one, which is, well, another two, Source Bio and Circassia. Do you want to just give us an update on both of those? Because yeah. Source Bio is about 125p. And yeah, Source uh, has it, actually been quite stable in, the, in, in recent months. They did a very mm. good acquisition, mm. which significantly strengthened their position in pathology. Mm. Uh, again, you know, we're washing out, or they're washing out all the COVID testing. Mm. So the company basically at the moment is downsizing because clearly we don't need 170 people doing COVID testing anymore. Mm. Um, and it's going to focus on pathology, genomics, and stability storage. Yep. But stability storage um, is a relatively slow growth business, but it's very profitable. Um, what stability storage does is if you're, manufacturing a drug you need to know what temperature it should be kept at and how long it it's good for at that temperature um pathology is the exciting business at the moment because sadly because of uh, covid the backlog for pathology is off the planet mm. this is elective, uh, elective procedures isn't it it's six million plus sort of stuff it, it's it's related anyway yes and particularly to to cancers where the yeah. company's got good market share. Um, so uh, basically the core business, which we, when we went public, we always argued was valuable, is, is still valuable. Mm. Uh, even even more so off, now after the acquisition. Even more so now after the acquisition. And we've still got about 15 million in cash. Mm. Um, so, I mean, the thing with these companies is the ones that are actually are profitable also all have cash. Mm. You know, there's no debt around these businesses. Um, so if you are going into tougher times, but logically, you know, 
these businesses should not be adversely impacted by a slowdown in consumer expenditure. Now, if anything, you're going to see a growth because of the um, elective procedures <laughs> or the desperate need to be able to treat um, patients rather than actually in hospital out in the community, the point of care side. Yeah. And if yeah. we go to the CAS, it's kind of the same story. They've yeah. had profit upgrades. Uh, they've got, again, no debt. I think they said they had 13 million in cash. Yeah. Um, and nothing's really changed. Uh, you know, we still believe the company's on for over 40 million in sales. Um, and we just, you know, refer everybody to the chief executive's target, yeah. which <laughs> he and we are very comfortable um, that is going to be achieved. Um, and in fact, you know, around 30p, you know, we are in fact probably going to be buyers of the stock in the near future. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just thought it's just, you know, crazy. But the guy's actually in Johnson as the exec chairman. Is they've over delivered. They've increased expectations, and the shares have have gone down. I mean, it's just is uh, totally illogical. But uh, hey ho. Um, I don't know if you want now. Just moving on to some sort of like you know productivity boosting sort of enterprise software with high recurring revenue streams. If you want to take us through sort of Maintel and uh, Tribal, because both of those have also come down. I know Maintel's got a bit more debt, but equally it's got lots of recurring revenue streams and sort of public sector and government contracts yeah. doing, doing managed IT but, services. I think. Yeah, I mean, the thing to remember about Maintel is because uh, we did buy some more. In fact, it's up a bit since we bought some more. Mm. Is that uh, you know, <laughs> the, the big shareholders in this company were actually private individuals turned down four pounds fifty a share last year in cash right. uh, from Daisy. Um, mm. We're still absolutely the belief the market caps give or take fifty million pounds. The debt is call it just call it twenty. Yeah, and you know the twenty twenty four number is north of fifteen million of EBITDA. Mm. south of 15 million of debt even having returns to the, to the dividend list you know we kind of see that as an eight times event and that you know is more than a double in the share price yeah um and if you go to 10 times ebitda you really could get quite excited mm. um tribal is a slightly different story tribal is all to do with uh basically software for universities yeah and the key to tribal is they, they're in the process of, of finishing two major uh, new products, most exciting one being admissions. Um, so the core business is changing to the extent that one-time revenues are declining. That's being replaced by growth in SaaS-based revenues. So the quality of the earnings is going up. And... Frankly, we see this company as a sitting duck to be acquired, you know, over a two to three year period. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I mean, I would say, you know, when it comes to sort of like, um, you know, digitization of universities, that's one of the areas or public sector that's so far behind and so, but so much work to do to drive out, in, to drive out inefficiencies, to improve productivity and all this sort of stuff. And you've now got this hybrid of online and classroom learning. I mean, it's just got to be in a good place with sort of like, you know, to upsell products and services as that whole industry transitions to di digital technologies. Yeah. And, well, they also want to move it up to the cloud too. You shouldn't underestimate that, which helps them. Um, which okay. actually has the same story as Maintel in that respect. Yeah, uh, it is. So this is... The, as I said, the issue here is the biggest shareholder, um, nobody really knows what their agenda is. Right. But I, but I think it's fair to say that, you know, once this, once they've done the, you know, the cleanup job, as we describe it, because this thing had to be cleaned up quite a lot, if you recall, it used to have lawsuits and, mm. um, and, They've still got to sort out the business that basically does exam marking because um, mm. COVID costs them a lot of their business in the Middle East. Yeah, it, it doesn't fit at all with the rest of it, but, but you need to clean it up before you, be, before you sell it. Yeah. So um, I think that's still sort of work in progress. 
Mm. Well, that, that sounds like needs just a bit of hardwood magic on that one, given you've, uh, <laughs> you're very good well, at this sort of Roger stuff. Roger McDowell magic on that one. <laughs> oh, is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, now, moving on to some even more cheaper chip sort of like value plays. Um, you've got uh, TPI cap, which is the sort of like, you know, the interdealer broker. And then you've got Appreciate, which is a sort of like a... I think it's a it's a Christmas hamper savings um, company, but also yeah, with other... it's, it, it's a bit more than that. Um, basically, they've got appreciators that it's not so much hampers; it's Christmas savings per mm. se, right? Uh, which could could, be, could ultimately be you know Mark suspensions vouchers. Yeah, um, it's also got a uh, loyalty program for big companies who are thinking we've got to do something for everybody at Christmas. So let's put them on our loyalty program rather than perhaps give them a Christmas party. Mm. Um, and basically this company is well two thirds of the way through a very expensive uh, upgrade in software, which I'm not entirely convinced was a great investment for them to make, but it, it, it's kind of too late now. Mm. Um, so you're looking at a market cap, it would take 50 million quid today. Yeah. Um, there's about 18 million in cash. Yeah. And a business that's trading at an EV bit DA multiple for the year that's ended of about three. Yes. Falling into, it falling into sort of the twos. Yeah. However, what's really, really interesting in this company, which the analysts don't seem to have cottoned on to, is they have a trust fund which has got about 200 million on average client money in it, but which they'd get the interest income on. Oh, right. So it's a massive beneficiary of rising interest rates. Right. Okay, well, it'll be interesting because I think they've got their prelims is it this week, I think maybe tomorrow or something like that. So um, Yeah. You... I mean, we met the chairman recently, um, who we know quite well because he was involved in Easy Hotels, Mm. and he's a really good guy i think he i mean he basically believes the stock is very significantly undervalued mm. um there's an activist uh, a european activist on the shareholder register as well um so if he doesn't get it right i suspect they'll start to activate and they've got over 10 percent of the company mm. um and you know people are talking about you know, the dividend yield being this year, you know, seven and a half percent. So you're paid uh, to wait. It's it's quite difficult to buy the stock. That's the problem. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, I'm not surprised there wouldn't be too many sellers at this level. I wouldn't have thought it'd be crazy. Now, uh, just on just just on TPI cap, because I mean, this has been a, obviously, but I mean, it, it's still looking at if you look at sort of this year's forecast, it seems to be trading on sort of like, uh, well, less than four times EV, EBITDA and sort of five or six times PE. And, 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 it, and it still should do well in a, in, a, in a highly volatile capital market. Okay, well, backdrop. that might be one reason for owning it, but it's, it's, it's not really why we do. Okay. Um, the market cap is about 930 million. Yep. Net cash is 100 million. Mm. And they own a platform company, a data platform company, which is expected to do about 90 million of EBITDA this year. Right. Um, we had the management into Metis. Uh, they said it was worth 1.5 billion, which doesn't frankly seem to be impossible. Uh, but let's go with 1.25 billion. Mm. That alone is worth more than the market cap. Yeah, they then bought a company called LiquidNet, which is, I think most people would argue they overpaid for it. Uh, they paid five hundred and fifty million for it. Um, it's actually not doing badly, um, mm. but let's be conservative and say it's only worth four hundred million now. And then you've got my hundred million in cash, and a business that's making, as you said, you know, way over a hundred million pounds. <laughs> must be worth something more than 100 million pounds yeah the other aspect of it is is that um their debt is all at fixed interest rates mm. uh so they but their cash isn't so uh hopefully they'd be getting some extra income out of that and then finally um 
60% of their revenues are in US dollars and only 40% are expenses are in US dollars. Right. But they should be a major beneficiary of, uh, you know, Strengthen the improvement in the dollar. Yeah. Is there any counterparty risk on this? Is I say for a large cap to be priced so cheap, it just looks weird to me, but... Uh... Well, most of the people they deal with are very, very large institutions and banks. Mm. I can't say there can't be no counterparty risk, uh, but if you go through the back of their accounts, uh, you, you seem to read a lot more about um, being cautious in uh, an, another bank fiddling libel and then right. getting thrown into it from time to time. Right. Uh, they don't, they, don't, they don't look after Credit Suisse or rather Russian banks, do they? <laughs> anyway, we'll wait and see. Well, well, I don't think they look after any Russian banks, but credit, no one's saying Credit Suisse can't pay their debts. That, well, that's right. Well, the credit markets are, are pricing them such they can't anyway. <laughs> I saw 9.75% uh -huh. was their latest bonds issue, which was a cocoa, but even so. God, I hadn't seen that, to be truthful with you. Um, <laughs> Just with the, they're moving on to some opportunities. And by the way, what they're saying is they're going to pay out 50% of their earnings in dividends mm. with the other 50% paying down debt. Mm. Um, they also have got to spend a few more tens of millions completing. One of the things with, is they have a lot of brokers who historically were never that loyal, but now that basically there's only three big, well, there's only three into deep, into into broker dealers anyway now mm. um, so staff turnover is going down but the technology they're spending should enable them to just you know pull out another 20 30 million out of their cost base over the next couple of years right so they've got so big efficiencies as well kind of everybody hates it um there's a small activist investor who's written um to them and again when we met the management recently they they realized that they had to do something, I think. Um, mm. And they emphasized at the meeting that Parameter uh, was a totally standalone company. It paid for its own research. Um, and as I said, their number for that business is one and a half billion. Well, anyway, it does look, when you look at some of the parts, any part, it looks. Uh crazily valued as, as a number of the other ones now another one with another area or whole sector that has been absolutely annihilated even though house prices are going up is the is the residential property and us obviously you own a long-term shareholder of uh, mj gleason and last time we spoke six months ago you were you were picking up your position in on the market do you want to take us through those two because i know i mean it, again it just you look at it and you've got house builders on less than sort of tangible book i know MJ Gleason is it's a slightly a bit in a premium, but even so, it just looks not much anymore. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think it's I think it's on tangible book now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, it's crazy. You're getting the business for free. Um, so okay, if we do the on the market first, again, mm. we had the management in literally in the last two weeks. Um, we kind of focus on how they intend to get to the 2025 number. Mm which is January 2025, so it's really 2024. Yeah. And basically, at the moment, uh, a right move office is paying something like 1,300 per office. That's the correct to that. advertise, some yeah. Will, some will be less, okay? Yeah. Well, these guys are at 200 pounds per office. Mm. And the right move is current and they increase their pricing every year is four pounds per lead mm. and on the market is one pound 40 per lead mm. so they believe they can increase their pricing over the next three years from 200 pounds to 300 pounds and they believe they can increase uh, the uh, uh, pricing for uh, uh, building companies from 100 to 300 as well um, so if you put that in context, um, there's 27.5 million approximately in uh, estate agents and 2.5 million in, in uh, housing. So that would take your housing to 
over 40 plus, state mm. agents to seven and a half, but let's be conservative and say five. And then they made a small little add on acquisition, which would add two million to sales, which would give you 47 million in sales. And then assume there's some attrition somewhere. Mm. Um, and then their advertising spend at 10.6 million, it had a big increase last year because they didn't have to advertise much during COVID. So they've gone back to more normal advertising. But they're saying that, frankly, they probably don't have to do very much more. Mm. Um, so as the revenues go from 30 million to 45 million, mm. you know, we were talking about advertising going from you know, 10 to 12 to 13. Mm. Uh, more like 12 and then you looked at all their other expenses which were um, about 13 last year and even if you made the assumption they went to 16 which is you know pushing it a bit but or, or we can say 17 you get a 15 plus million of EBITDA which is market forecast for 20 for as I said, January 25, um, you know, a dividend yield and 22 million in cash. Mm. And you've got a market cap today of, God, uh, not a lot, uh, 68 million. Yeah, 65, yeah. Now, there are a few more million shares that have to be issued because there was some founder mm. option, the free founder options. Mm. So the number of shares actually is probably closer to 85 million. But even so... Yeah, you're still looking at 73 million, mm. and in a couple of years out, 50 million enterprise value with 15 million pounds of EBITDA for a platform, yeah. it's absolutely bonkers. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it did. It does um, look crazy. I mean, Gleason has got the problem that all the all the house builders have got. Um, that's not to say they they as in all the other house builders aren't dealing with it. it's a perception and that is you've got rising prices mm. um although i suspect i suspect building prices are going to start to ameliorate mm. um certainly in the united states the price of timber started to fall very substantially yeah um i don't think you're going to have many house builders trying to materially increase housing uh in the short term so mm. that should take some of the pressure off bricks etc uh, but you will still have wage inflation but i suppose the plus of wage inflation is it means you can increase house prices because obviously to some extent the house price is a function of salaries mm. um so and particularly for gleason which is you know very much uh at the low end of the market the affordable end of the market yeah um the problem is you've got the government you know, virtually declared total war on them all um, mm. with uh, this cladding issue. Now, yeah. it's not a big issue for Gleason. I think they've said it's a few million. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, the next issue is pollution in rivers, which slows down planning approvals. Mm. And to put it in context, I, I think our planning approvals have gone from taking nine months to over 15 months at the moment. Because That's of crazy. the backlog, with backlog in local authorities. That is crazy, isn't it? When they sort of like, you know, the government says it wants to promote 300,000 new houses each year and they're only doing 200 and they increase the effectively the period that it takes to get planning permission through from nine to 15 months. That's just frankly nuts, but hey. <laughs> well, it's not them who's done that. It's local authorities. Yeah. Probably in a concept called working from home. Um, <laughs> or not working. <laughs> or not working from home, yes. Um, so, well, I can't say that because if someone... Yes, <laughs> if yeah, don't, yeah, yeah, no, no, we'll strip that one out. got one yeah, of our like... planning approvals. I don't want to find it's another three years. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a joke. That was a joke. Okay, <laughs> okay, just moving now on to sort of like some GARP secular growers. Asset Co., which has obviously been in the news a lot with uh, Martin Gilbert, the uh, the chairman, uh, and uh, you know, so I think you're on the board as well. So I know you can't yeah, say too much, um, but it's but it's a it's a buy and build company, an asset management that uh, has just sort of hoovering up some really first rate assets, River and Mercantile, and um, just recently um, Colin McLean, Colin McLean's uh, 
business um, SVM asset management up in Scotland. Yeah, and I think you know we should you know note that Colin took half his took half in a convertible loan note at fourteen pounds, but he took half mm. in our equity at fourteen pounds. Mm. Um, so he he saw something which clearly the market didn't see. Uh, there was massive insider buying last week, and I think that will continue, including yeah. ourselves. We bought eighty thousand shares. At, yeah. I think it's just on approximately seven pounds anyway. So, I mean, the whole thing's just a bit silly now. Um, the company's got 50 million in cash, approximately. Mm. Yeah. Um, obviously, River Mercantile did a great deal of due diligence into our business mm. um, when they took our paper. So, what got everybody's attention is a thing called Parmethian, which the broker's estimated is worth uh, between 70 and 90 million. So let's just go in the middle of that and call it 80. What does it do, uh, Christopher? Basically, it's a platform for IFAs. Right, okay. So it helps basically, yeah, th those guys to, to, to service their clients. Correct, yes. And it's a yeah. good platform. They like it. It was lost in uh, Aberdeen or whatever they call themselves now. Um yeah, okay. It's now very nicely profitable. Mm. Um, and, you know, just put those two assets together, you get over £10 a share. So mm. you get River and Mercantile, it's £3 billion for free. You get another platform for free, and you get the Scottish Hub for free. Um, <laughs> and the Scottish Hub, I don't know what the forecast is, but I think it's, it's over a million pounds now. Um, so that's got to be worth 10 million too. So it's all a bit silly. Yeah. But the oh, yeah, is, there's a lot that's a bit silly at the moment. And these things happen. And you know what? We've seen this all before. Mm. Um, the trick was going into the mess with cash. Yeah. Well, as I say, you know, you've been through a few cycles and you know these businesses are um, like the back of your hand. So uh, I would defer to the experts. Investors have a good look at Asset Co because. Uh, the, uh, the board there is absolutely top notch in, in terms of done this one before. Um, now you just yeah, Martin on. sadly knows how to build a fund management business. Yeah, no, I know he does. Yeah, he's done pretty well. He did pretty well out of us at um, Aberdeen, I'm sure. Um, having Traz, now I know when we chatted last time, this one does, um, you know, sort of critical parts and pumps and stuff and um, uh, <clears throat> nuclear storage uh, boxes and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and I didn't, I, I do know actually that it's got sort of 40, 50% exposure just to the nuclear industry which is you know sort of now getting a, another life because of obviously the uh, the problems with ukraine and russia um but equally i know you talked very um positively about which is something we're getting for free which is the magnetica healthcare um small form mri scanner do you want to just give us a quick sort of like round the houses on um Avintraz? yeah by all means i think the first point again is you know this is another company um which is you know got lots of cash um my understanding is the Luton site is seeing a very big increase in demand at the moment mm. so moving out of it may not be quite as easy as they originally thought um let's remember the you know in the in the Hayward Tyler business a lot of it is um parts or or replacement parts um not least of all for coal-fired power stations, which somehow are coming back into fashion again. Yes, um, particularly in Germany. <laughs> particularly in Germany. And then, of course, uh, the potential orders for those nuclear boxes mm. um, are off the charts. I mean, I was reading yeah. an article in one of the Sunday newspapers, I think two weekends ago, uh, basically talking about the fact that they've now really starting to uh, break up uh, a massive part of uh, Sizewell, which has got hundreds of thousands, well, thousands and thousands of tons mm. of, of this stuff that's got to go into these boxes. Mm. And at the moment, they are sole source of that. Um, mm. They're obviously a beneficiary of, um, you know, HS2 um, yeah. with all their specialty doors. Yeah. Uh, Blast proof. I mean, that looks aren't a they? big victory. I mean, I think yeah. they, they bought it for nothing. I think if they were to sell it today, they'd get at least 15 million pounds for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And I suppose the real issue with them is, you know, A, what will they do with the cash? Can they find another good deal? Because at the moment, they, they're, they're maximising what they've got. Um, they haven't really done a deal now for some time. Um, so, you know, you just need to keep the story going in that respect. It's a bit mm. like Melrose. Yeah. Um, well, well, you'll be able to help the them with that, Christopher, thing, I'm sure. <laughs> the medical thing, we're not going to really know till later this year. Yeah, but again, our discussions with the management lead us to conclude there's nothing going wrong there either. Mm. And as you said, it's totally in the price for free. Yeah, I mean, we Absolutely. think having trans without that is still worth five quid. Yeah, I, I couldn't get any less than five fifty. So um, yeah, no, I'm with you. Um, now, just moving on to just finally, just some reopening plays because um, I know you talked about them last time. We've got. Um, uh, Fulham Shaw, which is the old Frank Amanka. Um, I think it's is it David Page, the um, exec chairman there. You've got uh, Ten Entertainment, which does bowling alleys and is is actually doing well on the reopening. And then you've got Centaur Media with um, with Swag, who's uh, obviously on a, a sort of like a a big um, uh, increase in margins and, and a growth objective, which seems to be happening. So you want, to be, and, but the shares of all three have come down a lot, <laughs> which is why yeah, it's mean- just crazy. Again, I mean, we're actually got an order in to buy Fulham Shore at today's price. Um, yeah, 13p. I mean, it's got a, basically a market cap of 82 and it's doing a hundred over 100 million of sales, but it's really growing. It's the sort of the, say the Franco Manker and the real Greek, isn't it? Yeah, and look, one day he's going to break this thing up and sell it. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, you know, it's his, it's his last one. He, he's been very consistent, but he that this is not forever. It will ultimately be owned by, by somebody else. Um, I know he thinks, because we have discussed it, um, uh, that, uh, he, that he thinks you know, that, that the real value of this business starts definitely with the two. Um, right. And hopefully into a mid two. Um, and he'll do it when the time's right. Yeah. And, you know, the management team are very large shareholders themselves. Mm. Um, so why wouldn't they? Um, it's got no debt. So you said they're opening new new stores. Pizza is got margins, which mean that you can easily cope with food inflation and pizza. Mm. Um, and you've still got a weakened Pizza Express. Mm. And just for... Just my personal opinion, this is not a plug for one of my companies. I think a Frank Amanka pizza is way better. Yeah, no, I've heard that. The Express one. Yeah, and no, I've heard this. People like the sourdough crust, don't they? And uh, the toppings. And this, yeah, yeah, I've spoken I've spoken to many of people who are, who are permanent sort of uh, Frank Amanka um, uh, diners. Um, just so moving on now to the, the temp in bowling boys, um, the, the ten entertainment. I think they've got about 40, 50 um, sites, but they seem to be sort of adding on other other activities to their centres. And uh, that's, I mean, obviously, it's a challenging backdrop, but again, the shares have sort of like, you know, come off and try 10 well, times. Well, the funny PE. thing is there that, look, it can't last because mm. it's just impossible. But yeah, you know, so far this year, like for like sales, are, you know, are very substantially above 2019. Mm. And, I, and I don't mm. mean a little bit, I mean a lot. Mm. Um, I can't remember what the last number the company said, but I mean, you know, we're talking high 30s, already 40s. Yeah. And these businesses, um, when you get that sort of capacity utilization, a lot of it hits the bottom line. Mm. So, you know, 10 has gone from being um, a total basket case, courtesy of COVID, mm. to being back in a position where um, if you exclude, is it now has net cash. Mm. Um, I was sure it'll return to the dividend list sooner rather than later or at some stage. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's a very, very well-managed business. And, you know, we're, we are different to Hollywood Bowl. Hollywood Bowl is sort of going down um, the route of crazy golf, et cetera, where, right. where we are sort of very focused on maximizing the value of our box, if that makes mm. sense to you. Yeah, it does, yeah, yeah. Um, and <laughs> you might be amused. Most, 
most profitable thing in on a return on it on capital employed in, in, in the box is actually ping pong. Oh, is it table tennis? Wow, <laughs> table tennis. That's it. <laughs> well, there you go, and it gives you that. You can change these, swap them out as they go in and out of fashion. You can swap them out quite easily. But yeah, I'm with you, sort of like sort of maximizing the return on 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 floor footprint makes total sense, you know, in terms of uh, you know what you do. But um, and use the um, and use the temp in br- to bring people in, but upsell as they go through and keep it fresh. Why not? The thing now is people people are relatively short of money. Mm. They want to have a bit more of an experience. Mm. So, you know, if you're going to sort of a, a restaurant and it's going to be, you know, 15 pounds a head, um, you know, you can come to a 10 pin, you know, have play the game, do a bit of the other stuff around it and have, you know, a meal for 15 quid. Yeah, totally get it. And also with the, the summer, with more people actually now can, having so many problems going abroad for their holidays, they're looking for staycations. You might find actually this summer's not a bad period either because... People have decided to uh, to holiday in the UK. Um, now, yeah, now you don't move- want it, you do, I don't want to be a sort of uh, put a dampener on the discussion, but you don't want it to be too hot in the summer. Yes, yeah, <laughs> days true. like today are kind of perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah, gotcha. Um, just with um, with with Centaur, because obviously you know Swag Mukherjee, the um, the CEO's put together his four year strategy to improve margins, and uh, I think the, the shares. I mean, they're, they're basically owned sort of like valuable internet real estate like the lawyer and uh i think um e consultancy and do you want to give us a quick update on that one yes i mean we haven't i'm, I'm due to see swag quite soon mm. um obviously richard Stavely, who runs rockwood is now on the board of it yeah um and you know we think it's a, a massive store of value mm. um if you basically say that there's a, I think from memory, it's about 150 million shares outstanding, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 147. Okay, so, yeah. So, so let's just take that 150. Then, if you take by the time you, you've, you know, December next year, which is sort of the year where he's got his, his targets, which is mm. 10.6 million EBITDA. And if you add back the corporate overhead, you, you're looking at probably 12 million for the underlying businesses. Yeah. And by then, I would have thought it'd be disappointing if the cash, well, it depends on dividends or cash returns, but if if the cash wasn't up to, say, 20 plus million. Yeah. So is it really so insane to think the rest of those businesses are worth 10 times? Yeah, you've got basically enterprise value. You'll have it sort of like uh, if you had 20 million of cash just north of well, about 50 mil, you know, <laughs> with a 10 million EBITDA. Yeah, I mean, it's well, it's, it's remember, so the underlying businesses will be close to 12. 12, yeah, so, exactly. Well, so, then, you, yeah. you know, that takes you to double the current share price mm. in 18 months. Yeah. Yeah, and it's got valuable. I mean, they, it's got the first party data, hasn't it? Because it's, it's got its own um, internet real estate. As people like Apple move to stop tracking, then anybody who's got unique properties online is going to be more valuable for advertisers and for monetizing. Well, I mean, I think the whole point is that it's, this is absolutely not a, a, a print business anymore. Mm. Um, you know, print would probably be a very small percentage of revenues now. Mm. Um, you've got basically kind of four blocks in there. You've got the lawyer. Mm. Um, which is a dominant market leader. Mm. Um, you've got Marketing Week, which also is the festival of marketing, mm. uh, the smallest business. Um, then you've got the e-learning businesses and e-consulting businesses, which are very, very valuable. Mm. And then you've got a rapidly growing um, influencer business where basically what they do is that if somebody wants to you know, launch a global product, finding the right influences in the right countries. Um, and I, I was sort of undervalued that business, but you know, I've increasingly come to, coming to the conclusion that that's a better business than I thought it was. Mm. Um, but again, you know, you've got no debt, lots of cash, um, no need to you know, generating cash. Um, 
with, with a team that's focused to build value for shareholders. And with Harwood having almost 30% of it, so he's going to make sure that the uh, the business delivers. <laughs> That's the agenda, thing. yes. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> with, with, a, with a, a sort of like a surefire credit on that one. Um, so, we, so just come in, I mean, I would say to, to investors, we're just coming sort of full circle now. And, you know, given what we talked about in the, the start, i.e. there's a, a huge discount, particularly on the uh, North Atlantic fund uh, for prices. And we've just run through, obviously, a bit of the private companies and with the, the public companies. And I would say there's a lot of hidden intrinsic value that isn't even reflected as over and above the, the net asset value. And the shares are trading at sort of like a lot less you know, a discount than the effort. So I, I would point investors, if you want a sleep at home type of investment, trust investment, then uh, have a look, have a good look through that. Now, Christopher, in terms of... And on top of it, we do actually buy our stock back uh, from yeah. time to time. Yeah, well, don't um, buy too many because I was going to say, if people want to sort of like uh, buy some of the uh, those funds at all, Christopher, where's the best place? Who's the best person to sort of contact? Because... It does look, I mean, you know, this is, it's another silly valuation, the investment trust. Yeah, I mean, the answer is I'm always very happy to talk to anybody who wants to give me a call. Mm. You know, I've always been very open. Um, we actually get, sadly, we just had our annual general meeting, but you'd be amazed how many people turn up for it. Yeah. Um, hopefully it isn't entirely because they get given a, at my expense, by the way, a glass of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and probably a very good glass of champagne as well. So, um, but no, I think, you know, you know, it's worth pointing out that our family, you know, my family had 32% of that trust. Mm. Um, so we're very careful with it, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Okay, well, well, well great. I mean, thanks. For, I really appreciate your, your insights again. I know investors... Well, I'm massively thankful for hearing. It's particularly myself and my wife, and my wife, my, my dad, who's a, a real sort of follower and and uh, you know really really rates Harwood. So uh, thanks again, Christopher, and uh, look forward in touching base um, in uh, in six months' time. Well, thank you once again for your time too. Um, yep. Keep safe and have a I happy summer do. holiday. Yeah, thank you. Cheers, Rick. Okay, bye-bye. bye bye.